Good morning. Welcome back to Chop for Time. I'm Devin, and I'm joined with Ben and Thomas, and we just want to say thank you for joining us. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, as we uh, share together in this Chop for Time, we ask that you'd bless the word into our hearts, Lord God, as well as everyone who is who is listening and watching in Jesus name amen I mean, well, good to be back. It's been a little while. What's it, what, three weeks? Yeah, and and you know, I, I kind of had to laugh a little bit as I was looking at some of the postings and recordings and stuff we do. The the last on the spot that we did uh, was on consistency. Right. Yeah, so it's a it <laughs> defined irony there. But, you know, somebody went to Hawaii, you know, and we've just been doing stuff. So I'm Suffering for the gospel. Suffering, brother. brother. <laughs> suffering. Yeah. Amen. Well, it's a blessing to be back again. And, you know, my heart is always encouraged as we share, and I'm hoping other people are Amen. as well. Um, you continuing forward in the fear before God, the fear of God, and just loving this series, you know, because it's something that we need to do. So many times we miss out on that proper aspect of fear. We think of fear like it was Halloween night last night, screaming, trembling, biting my fingernails, running from some scary person with a knife. But, you know, when we're talking about fearing God, it's, it's even though there is that, there is still that trepidation that's there, it is not quite the biting fingernails and running from the knife. Right. Can you just uh, kind of key us in, key the viewers in on what you shared yesterday? Yeah. Or, um, excuse me, Sunday? That's all right. I may, may have shared it yesterday, <laughs> too. Who knows? Uh, yeah. Trembling at his word. Tremble at his word. And we went from Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, mm. which basically, you know, God says to Isaiah, says, tell them this, that the Lord says that heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Um, you know, I'm looking, where is my house mm -hmm. that you were to build me? Where am I going to find my rest? And then it goes into saying, you know, he says that listen, it's because of all of these things. I'm because all of these things exist. They exist because of me. Uh, and then he's, he describes this place of rest of someone who is of a poor and contrite heart and who trembles at his word. Mm -hmm. And listen, Sunday was a information heavy kind of message. And I knew it was going to be going in because there are certain passages and certain things that we don't deal with very often that just present us with questions. Like these statements should present us to seek an answer. So part of the qualification of one of the virtues, because we talked about the three virtues, one of the virtues of becoming a place where he will rest mm. is to tremble at his word. Yes. Okay. I mean, so what, you know, I think the question is that is like, what does it mean to tremble at his word? Like, does it literally mean tremble? It could. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that there's a weight to his word yes. and his voice that should cause us to tremble. Mm -hmm. But, I don't think we walk around in a constant state of trembling. But one of the things that I do believe we need to do, and the, and the simplest definition that I could provide to the congregation on Sunday was trembling at his word means to be obedient no matter what the circumstance. Mm -hmm. You know, Be obedient to his word no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the cost, no matter what the price. Trembling at his word means that we're going to value his word and be obedient to that, regardless of what the outcome yes. of that obedience might be. So we looked at that. We we really kind of exposited verses one and two because he starts out before he gives the qualifications and the virtues for those in whom he wants to rest. He first says, "You need to acknowledge who I am first. Mm -hmm. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, yes. and I'm looking for a house to dwell in." Um, and, and that's where we, we kind of went from there, at trembling at his word of this understanding of there's outplayings of this, there's recognitions of this, and then there's also questions that we have to answer in this, uh, in this vein as we're looking at do we really tremble 
at his word. Right. And it comes with that. Are we being obedient? Is there joy and gladness? Is there right. gratefulness in our lives? Are we uh, only being obedient when it's convenient for us? Yes. Are we only being obedient when things are going our way? And are we truly navigating and living this life with a sense of joy and gladness and gratitude in his presence? Yes. I mean, I think that's powerful, you know, because we, when we get to that place of, hey, I'm exalting in God, I'm exalting in what he says, I believe that this is the written word of God, as we talked about, you know, unchanged, infallible, inerrant, and and those things, you know, know, we're getting to, going to go through the takeaways right now, and mine was just that, you know, you said that we have a place where not only does fear, fear and trembling Uh, And just, you know, that part of where there's a sincerity, but also joy and gladness. Mm -hmm. And I once worked for a boss who was a very powerful billionaire. And when he called me in, there was a sense that, um, you know, I was listening intently to what he had to say. He was a very powerful man. He, you know, had dinner with presidents, you know, I'm like, Mm -hmm. wow, it's just, you know, these things right there. So but when I came in, there was also when he spoke kindly to me, when he did those things, when I received, he just had some things for me. And there was that joy and gladness that I was performing what he said. So that kind of was a, a neat takeaway for me because I got to think about how it was in that situation for me and how it, how sometimes, you know, his words filled me with, you know, joy. Hey, well done. Well yeah. done. You know, yeah. so there was that part in there that was uh, devout, but I listened intently to what he had said. And I made sure that I performed his thing because he had a few things that he disliked a certain way. And, you know, how much more should I do that with God? Mm-hmm. And should I be that way listening to my father? How about yourself, Thomas? What stood out for you? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ben and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday or Monday, and, you know, the the... The thing that really stood out to me was this sort of obedience to Christ, no matter the circumstances. Uh, and and I was sort of processing with them, you know, that one of the things I've been wrestling with recently and when reading through the Gospels again is that sometimes I come across a teaching of Jesus that contradicts the, the teachings I have been taught about what Jesus said, mm. if that makes sense, whether it's to do with generosity or whether it's to do with like this radical type of... Um, zeal or passion for what he's called us to do like one example of that was you know whenever uh, the the multitudes left him was when he said um you know I, I tell you the truth if you don't eat my blood and or eat my flesh and drink my blood you know you're, you're not you don't you, you, you don't have it you don't got it and everybody left and you know you talked about this recently of and the disciples stayed and Peter's response was, the things that you say are hard. <laughs> like, <laughs> Difficult. Yes. Yeah. And and it, it was one of those things the other day where, you know, not to get into a debate about communion or how that, you know, transubstantiation or, or all that kind of stuff, but I was taking communion a couple of weeks ago and I was, I was there and I was just like, you know what, God, I don't really know what this means, but I pray that in this moment, I honor you in mm. consuming your body and drinking your Amen. blood. And I was like, uh, like... I don't know if I'm about to turn Catholic if this starts to taste weird, to do that. <laughs> like if everything is wrong. But I was like, but it was a very humbling experience, and it was kind of nerve wracking because I was like, I don't know if this is different. I'm trying to take this as seriously as I can in ways that I probably haven't before, um, or or when it comes to you know generosity, like you know we're told it's it's good to be good to those who are good to you, but be good to those who hate you. Mm. You know, bless those who persecute you, all these kinds of things. And I was like. Well, I've never really had to do that before. And God's like, well, here you go. <laughs> just Here's plopped, a, yeah. plopped a circumstance in my life where he was like, give it a go. And I was like, gosh, okay. <laughs> you know, but it's so kind of cultural because, you know, we're in a, we're in a world where we're just taught, you know, you know, we're, God is a God of justice. Therefore we should hate bad people and love good people. And Jesus is like, yes, God is a God of justice, but you should love the bad people as much as the good people and seek that they find me as much as the good people do. Right. You know, and, and it's just countercultural, you know, and that's, that was a, you know, it was encouraging just to hear that, that message of obedience to Christ, regardless of the outward uh, opinions and perspectives, wh- whether it's from non-Christians or Christians or anything that contradict what Jesus says, mm. pursue him first and foremost. So that was a bit of a ramble, but that was my, no, my take away. Good stuff. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I think the thing that's challenged me the most, because, you know, like I said, it, it's been a couple of weeks since I 
you know, preached on a Sunday morning. So this one was kind of one that was marinating with me yes. for a while. Uh, and one of the challenges that I've faced the past couple of weeks in, in the lead up to this is that, uh, you know, one of the realizations that I said that we had to understand, you know, foundational truths that we had to understand. One of those is that God is love mm. and we are his target. Amen. You know, for God so loved the world. Yes. You know, it's like when you look at someone else, you're seeing a target of God's love. Balancing that with this obedience, no matter the circumstance, mm. no matter what the the result, no matter what the price, no matter what the cost, because sometimes I think that we can lead with the obedience, no matter what the circumstance, and we we weaponize that, mm. and we don't lead with love. Yes, you know that just that balance that we have to try to find of being obedient to him regardless of the circumstance or the cost but then also understanding that god is love Mm. we are his target which means that if that obedience no matter what the circumstance requires me to interact with someone that i may not agree with right you know someone that i may have to have some type of confrontation with or disagreement with that i have to lead with the love of god because that person is also the target of his love Mm. That that was kind of the biggest takeaway for me to that that balance. I love it. Should always come back to you know uh, everything that we're learning to, is seen through the eyes of God's love for us and God's love for others. I think that's you know because when we're loving God correctly, it works into loving yeah. others. Yep. Um, so one of the things that you know we talked about from Isaiah 60, uh, 66, 1 and two, but upon this one I look, and you brought this up in one of the little chief characteristics right there was poor in spirit. And I kind of, you know, as we were talking earlier today, we we felt that that was a key passage. We could actually just build on that because what is this really poor in spirit? Somebody who's poor and contrite or humble at my word, you know, so... Uh, and Jesus, once again, and then if you watch the Chosen movie, I really liked how he breaks in in Matthew chapter 5 and the mm-hmm. Sermon on the Mount. And I love in that movie they talk about he's looking for a map. You know, he, he nails the Sermon on the Mount. He's like, I need to give a map, a key to getting into heaven. So he starts off with this uh, poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. The very first key that he opens into it here, you have to be poor in spirit. And, you know, just drawing that back to the passage of Isaiah 66, uh, to me, this is the response that God is looking for. People who are needy. Mm. You know, um, in Revelation 2, I believe it is that um, he talks to the Laodicean church and tells them, you say you're rich and you have all these things and you don't need anything. He says, but I tell you that you're wretched, miserable, poor, and, you know, blind and naked, you know, and he, he just gives it to you guys are not this because you say you're this. And, and if we come to the passages, you know, over and over, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Those who are poor in spirit are those who know that they have a need for God and can't make it by themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, this word poor, I believe, and the Greek means people that were completely destitute and could not provide for themselves in no matter what so ever. They were beggars, basically. They were broken. Broken, poor, you know, to recognize our need for God in such a way that we can't make it without Him. You know, because i got to come back to that over and over again. I am destitute yeah i need god i think it's when i start thinking that i'm making it is that often the times that i have my worst stumblings you know that are my feelings i'm like oh man you know because god's gonna like well if you think you can stand take heed because you're gonna fall you know so i need to come back to the place like i need you i need you god i need you in every year month i need you even where i don't think i need you please help me you know and i think that's the that's the continued pride of, if you look through the bible that's the people over and over you know lord search me try me see if there's some wicked way in me because they knew they needed god even when they didn't know it and so you know they cry out for these things and to me that's what that says i need god and it's i'm in danger when i think i don't know him because God's not watching me then, you know, because he's like, hey, you're going to stumble by yourself. But when I'm poor, needy, he's like, oh, now I'm, I've got you. We're going to I'm gonna carry you along through this. Yeah. Um, so we have some other passages we were going to look at today. Um, that was First Matthew 5, 3. Uh, Thomas is going to share with us, um, I believe, Isaiah 6, 5. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in, in the book of Isaiah, we have one of these cool passages where 
someone enters the throne room. And we sort of see, I think we see it like three or four times happening throughout the Bible. You know, we got Daniel, uh, Isaiah, and, and John in the book of Revelation. But I love, I love, I've always loved all of those passages. So whenever Isaiah enters the throne room, um, it, he says, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Uh, and the thing I think is really cool about that is just this recognition of like, you know, this is a guy who's served, he's a prophet, he's served the Lord for a long time, but um, the moment he sees him in his true glory, in his, like, in his th- on his throne, the realization of just how big he is probably dawns on him in the level that it probably never had before, you know. Um, we don't really say, woe to me, I am ruined, but, um, you know, I, we, I had a pastor back home translate to, oh crap, I'm screwed. Like, <laughs> it's all over, I'm going to die. Um, and I, I love the, the um, passage in Revelation chapter one where John has the same encounter. And actually, I mean, it's very, very similar in, in vision of, of what he sees. Um, but uh, whenever he sees God on the throne, he gives this, or uh, Jesus on the throne, he gives this big, long list of, you know, like the hairs on his head were like white as wool, all this kind of stuff. But it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Mm. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. Um, and I, I just think that's such an interesting thing as well, because we're, here we're talking about John, like this is the guy who like reclined up against Jesus as like this you know, younger brother looking up to his older brother and like hung out with Jesus every day for three years and all of a sudden sees Jesus for who he really is and like just collapses, Mm. like just can't even Mm. stand up, you know? And I think that's a really, I think that's important for us all to remember is like this God that we pray to, the one who speaks to us through his word, um, even his closest friends collapse as they're dead at the sight of him. And oftentimes I think we really take for granted, like, you know, yeah, that's my buddy Jesus. And it's like, I mean, yeah, but also, you know, he's much bigger, much greater, much more powerful than, you know, we could ever um, even comprehend. Um, And if he is that powerful, how much more should we tremble at the fact that he's speaking to us? Like his words, we should take them so seriously. You know, um, I just think those are, they're really cool passages. I think it's just a, a, a humbling humbling passages to read to recognize just how big God is um, so yeah. amen I think you know that's just a key a key point right there because this was the disciple whom Jesus loved and yet here he is falling at his feet as though dead and trembled you know you mentioned that word yeah. trembled afraid you know uh, there it is right there but yeah. he's still the disciple whom Jesus loved but he has the right perspective of God. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we have another passage. I believe it's from Luke 18. Luke 18, yeah, verse 13. And this is Jesus. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, and this is coming off of the Pharisee seeing, you know, the tax collectors, the sinners, the yes. less than them, saying, Thank God that I'm not like them, for I pray so often, I fast so often, and I'm just so glad that I'm not like them. Yeah. And then verse 13, this is Jesus says, And the tax collector, standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying god be merciful to me mm. a sinner it's just that recognition you know the humble the yeah. humility again the the broken the contrite the poor in spirit this humility of understanding it's like listen i can't even look up can't even look i don't even deserve to look up because i need your mercy because i'm a sinner Yes, I'm I'm wretched, and I I love this because we're kind of getting a um, both sides of the coin kind of here. What Thomas read out of Rev, or out of Isaiah, and then out of Revelation one, you know, talking about these two impactful men of God right. who had a history, a relationship. Isaiah, who had served him for many years, John, who walked with him, and both of them just like I should be dead. That's right. Yeah, I should be dead. So we've got this holy reverence of people who know God. But now we're seeing this example of someone who is lumped with one of the social lows on the hierarchy of the socioeconomic scale here, this tax collector who they weren't reputable people, you know, considered very much sinners. So we've got these saints of God. And now we're getting this picture that 
it doesn't matter where you're at in your position Amen. in life. We need him. Period. Without him, we're broken, we're destitute, we're crippled, we are just we're dead. And that's what the Bible tells us, you know, that yeah. with without him we are dead. And I just I love um, that look at how the Bible gives us this range of doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how close, quote unquote, that you've been in the past. You need me. Amen. It's just powerful. It is, you know, because each circumstance is different right there. And I love that you brought out, you know, that Isaiah was a godly man. He was a person that saw prophecy. He got, saw, you know, what was going to happen in Israel. And, but after a number of years, he went into the temple, saw God, lifted up, and then he cries out, Woe, unto, woe is me, for I am undone. And then, you know, but afterwards, an angel come and touches his lips with the tongs mm-hmm. from the altar and says, Hey, you're cool now, man. You know, this has touched your lips. You're cleansed. And I just love, you know, and Paul, you know, when he said, woe is, he said, woe is me for I am. He said, man, who will deliver me from this body of death? Mm-hmm. I thank God through Jesus Christ. So um, that's kind of my takeaway from the whole thing right there is that we just need to continue the process of crying out and saying, God, I need you. I need you today. My mom taught me a song a long ago. I'm not going to sing it today, <laughs> but it was the words were, I need you more more than yesterday. I need you more, more than words can say, um, you know, more than the air I breathe, more than the song I sing, I need you more, you know? Um, and, and so it was just a, I just remember my mom taught me that song and it's, I has always echoed, you know, because I need to sing that song, man. I just like, mm-hmm. and when I do, I'm realized, yes, I need him more than I ever did before. And it, and it, it has to be today and we have to come back again. You know, God, I need you to cleanse me. God, I need you because I'm poor, wretched, miserable, and blind. And I just go back into that state so often. So that's kind of what stands out for me. What about yourself, Thomas? Yeah, well, one of the things I was thinking about there as you were talking there, Ben, was last night uh, with our um, college age group, we were watching we we're watching through The Chosen and then we're sort of dissecting like, you know, uh, which of these pieces are biblical, which pieces are maybe creative liberties and stuff like that. But we were at the, at the episode where he is uh, speaking to his own people uh, from Luke chapter four, you know, where he says that no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And then, you know, they take him out to this cliff to throw him off the edge. But there were a couple of things that they added into that scene uh, that were very good, you know, clearly biblically accurate and and consistent. Um, And one of the things that he talked about was that if you don't recognize that you're spiritually poor, you cannot or I cannot give you my salvation. Mm. It's kind of like the the language that they use. And I thought that's that's so powerful. I mean, that's true. That's like the, the, the prerequisite to faith in Christ is recognizing that I'm broken and that I, yeah. I'm in desperate need of saving. Um, and all of this sort of is all part of that. You know, like it's unless we recognize just how big and how perfect God is and that that's the standard. Once we recognize that and recognize how far down <laughs> we are from that standard, we realize just how big and amazing God is and how much we need him. You know, and I think that's a really important thing is to recognize uh one, how broken we are, but two, how amazing and huge God is mm. in a terrifying but terrific way. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, uh, and and the, the joy that comes with the fact that he's not just going to smite us, but he offers us salvation. I think it's just such a beautiful thing. So right. I love that too, because you have both aspects. You can't have good news without bad news. You need to yeah. have the bad news is that we're broken poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. And then comes the good news. He will clothe us with the righteousness of Christ, the gospel, the salvation. Yeah. What about yourself? Yeah, just the consistent reminder, <clears throat> excuse me, that I believe that uh, part of trembling at his word um, really is, is it should always lead us into a reminder, like Thomas was saying, of just how incredibly big that yeah. God is, you know, and just, I, I referenced it a little bit on Sunday morning, but he's saying that heaven is my throne, this place that we can't even begin to fathom right. from, from all eternity past to all eternity future, yes. never ending something that's so big, we can't even begin to comprehend. God's like, that's where I sit. Yes. You know, the, the earth, all of this creation, this wonder, this majesty that, that you're here and you're dwelling in, that's where my feet rest. Hmm. That's just how big God is. So awesome. Yeah. Big God. Yep. He's able to do anything. 
you can do the impossible. Mm-hmm. Like cleanse us. <laughs> right, save right, us. Amen. Yeah. Amen. What's impossible with men is possible with God. So we just uh well just wanna just thank everybody for just the input and thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. If you have any comments or questions that you'd like us to answer, please write them uh, down below. Take a moment to like and subscribe. This will get this out to even more people. And um, if you'd like to contact us, we can be reached at FCCGrayson.com. Or you can just give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. If you don't have a home church, we invite you to come participate with us. We'd love to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ together. With that, let's close out in prayer. Ben, would you close out? Absolutely. God, thank you um, that you are mindful of us. Thankful that you do love us. uh, That we are a target of of you and, and your love. God, I pray that you would use this to help uh, continually heighten our awareness of you in our lives, that without you, we are completely undone and completely broken. And I just pray that we approach you, approach your word, and approach our relationship with you uh, even more aware of who you are. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.